want to extend my thanks to Winnie Frost for really setting this up uh, several weeks ago. Some of you may know um, Winnie's been in suddenly in ICU at Reston Hospital for a couple of weeks and just came out to be in PCU, progressive uh, critical uh, care. And uh, so we hope she is doing well. Uh, we're glad to have Jerry Peters, a uh, uh, long time, I think, resident of Great Falls, uh, a UVA graduate in biology and uh, has a master's as well in uh, environmental science and technology from Virginia Tech and is serving as our elected Drainsville representative to the Northern Virginia Soil and Conservation District. And uh, so he'd like to talk to us here for about uh, 25 or 30 minutes. And I'll have some remarks on other topics at the end of his presentation. Uh, but first, after his presentation, you'll be able to ask some questions. And in the interim, as Peter recommend it, please, uh, you know, under the chat button, uh, enter any questions you may have. Uh, Jerry, can I turn it over to you? Okay, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Peter. Uh, am, am I, is it my audio on now, Peter? You're great, Jerry. We're good, good to go. Okay, I'm Jerry Peters. I've been a member of the um, uh, Environmental Parks and what used to be Trails Committee. Uh, for a number of years. Uh, I'm also a, a representative of the, uh, I was elected to the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District. And, and Bill, that was a countywide election, that wasn't just Drainsville. Uh, but I do represent the um, uh, Soil and Water Conservation District also on the Tree Commission. So uh, the things I'm going to talk about now that are directly related to those other activities that I've got. Um, whereas Green Fire itself <clears throat> has, has also got a broad mission. And if you go to the website, which is greenfireweb.com, uh, uh, you'll find the vision. I'm going to two of the two of the four points in the vision. I want to I want to tell you about and kind of give you a context for uh, the, my presentation. Uh, one is uh, a slogan. The slogan of Green Fire is healthy forests, healthy wildlife, and healthy people. Uh, we want to do all three together. Secondly, uh, our vision is to have owners, landowners, uh, educated and uh, motivated to provide habitat stewardship on their own properties. And, and a lot of people don't, this is not their job, uh, it's not even their hobby. Uh, so we have a real challenge ahead of us to, to get the word out and say, yes, you own the land, you have some responsibilities for it. In a public welfare sense, uh, you have a responsibility to maintain your property in a way that, that, suits, that suits the population. Um, Green Fire is a 301, 501c3 organization since 2011. Um, and so we, we qualified for that and, and continue to pursue that. Let's talk about uh, the threats to healthy land habitats, uh, it, typically in the, in the suburbs such as we're in here. Um, one, the first one everyone understands that we're losing forest, we're losing natural uh, landscapes to development. Uh, the woods are getting fragmented. That is, if, if you know, we, we build a house in the woods with a drain field and a driveway, we essentially take our cookie cutter out of the woods. Uh, that creates a lot of edge habitat, which is good if you're a deer, okay? So, but the, uh, the fragmentation uh, is not good if you're a, a deep woods uh, specialist, say like the wood thrush. Second threat is too much lawn. Uh, we have a lot of lawn that is not in fact used for um, lawn purposes, which is active use. Um, uh, if we could convert some of the, the, what I call scenic lawn into natural landscaping. Uh, we would derive certain uh, services from, from that, not only increase biodiversity in Great Falls, uh, but also improve stormwater runoff, uh, sequester carbon, and a lot of things. Uh, just in the last couple of days, natural landscaping, a term I'm going to come back to later, uh, has, has come up in a very specific uh, um, uh, situation at the Grange and the old schoolhouse. I will get back to that. 
uh, I want to finish the presentation and then, then I want to make a, uh, a pitch to the uh, uh, membership of the Citizen Association about an opportunity to pursue natural landscaping uh, here in Great Falls. The third threat is invasive plants. And, and again, deer are involved in this. The uh, deer preferably eat native plants. That's what they evolved to eat and that's what they like. Um, plants don't become invasive uh, around here with the number of deer we have unless deer don't like it. So a lot of the things that, that annoy landowners and particularly woods owners um, and, and, and exert a cost to maintain your, your woods in a healthy sta uh, state uh, requires removal periodically of invasive plants. Pesticides and, and the predominant one that we deal with here are the mosquito uh, people. There are, there are no uh, pesticides that uh, don't kill all the other insect life along with the mosquitoes. And so that's a problem. I'm not going to address that tonight, but it's on the list of things that are concerning. And a lot of people don't think that lack of fire is a threat um, <clears throat> because fire itself is, a, is, is a, uh, a threat to our homes, but the lack of fire uh, causes the, the ecology of the forest to change. Uh, our forests uh, throughout the East Coast, uh, it, uh, before, before settlement, before English settlement, um, was regularly burned. It was burned actively by, by the Indians. They didn't do it every month, they didn't do it every year, but, but most of the landscapes here uh, are, are um, uh, evolved uh, to, to handle fire. Classic example of the oak, the thick bark of the oak protects it against fire. And so it, it, where, the, where there are regular fires, oaks are actually more competitive in landscapes that have fire. Uh, the, key, the key threat that green fire deals with, in fact, my day-to-day my -day and week-to-week -week activities have to do with the fact that we don't have any large natural predators. We have some unnatural predators. Uh, we have vehicles on the road um, uh, that, that take out deer. <laughs> we have uh, archers who, as the green fire is doing, is trying to replace the natural predators. Um, and, and we have limited that amount of disease, but there's no, there's no natural uh, control over the deer population. The fact is we've had for the last 20, 30 years, an overabundance of deer. Um, now you'll see a little note here, uh, the asterisk is, is, but wait and see about coyotes. Coyotes are uh, uh, probably doing a, a, ser a service by harvesting uh, fawns and, re and reducing the reproduction rate to give, give us a chance to be able to control the population. We'll see how that goes. That, that's a, a, a factor that needs to be played out. Uh, I would make a pitch to, to all landowners <clears throat> in, in Great Falls and suburban areas like this to uh, adopt the vision of, of habit, habitat improvement. Um, and four things you can do right off the top. Uh, this is not hard to do. Uh, that there are some guidelines or, that we need to educate people about the four to uh, allow surplus lawn, that is lawn that's not required for active use, you know, your kids playing soccer or football, uh, you know, whatever, uh, to succeed to meadows or forests. Um, I understand some situations where a forest is not going to be appropriate, but in, in some situations, meadows are. Uh, they are. They're either burned or they're cut over once every three years, and they provide a, a much more scenic uh, vista, I think, than, than our, our, our five acres worth of lawns we have some of, and some of our houses. Um, the process of succession, and that's a natural process, can be accelerated uh, by by Various means, of course, they cost money. Just letting it succeed by itself goes a lot goes a lot slower. Uh, but we can we can manage succession to get the kind of landscape that we prefer for the benefit of the wildlife and the water quality, etc. Second point is don't mow in the woods. Um, we're going to uh, and and don't mulch uh, under trees. Uh, fer fertilization and and the cultural practices go along with lawns are not compatible with trees. And I'll, I'll bring up a, a new, a new uh, uh, occurrence that just happened recently that with the two oaks uh, that came down on the, uh, the Grange and, and old schoolhouse uh, property managed by Fairfax County Park Authority. Um, the fact is we have turf 
not only in the in the grove uh, behind the grange, but it's a closed canopy. I mean, those trees are all filling up the, the airspace, uh, but also around these, these two trees that um, fell down. We, the Park Service was mowing uh, and fertilizing, I guess they're fertilizing under those trees, did not help the oak trees. And last is don't feed wildlife. Uh, the more I learn about wildlife and, and how they interact and, and the challenges in, in maintaining diverse wildlife, uh, feeding them, even bird feeding, uh, is, is not helping. So that could be a lecture all by itself. But these are things that, that landowners can do right now. They don't have to wait for a green fire to come and, and help them with the deer problem. <laughs> but landowners can participate in deer population control. Uh, we have some landowners who, who hunt themselves. I mean, not hunting themselves, they themselves are hunting. Um, uh, and Green Fire has got a program. It takes about two hours to go through. I, I meet individually with landowners who want to learn how to hunt deer themselves. And uh, I, I go through all the steps required, the skills you want to learn, and some of the knowledge you'll need about, uh, about how to um, uh, track, scout for deer, to, to shoot them, to retrieve them, and to make beneficial use of deer. If anybody's interested, contact me at Green Fire. Uh, we'll have contact information at the end. The main way that people help us uh, with the deer is to grant access to us to hunt, we allow, allow them to hunt on their property, or at least to track and retrieve. If we're hunting nearby, uh, the deer don't just drop in their tracks when we, when we uh, using archery. Um, uh, and that, which is what we're limited to here in Great Falls, uh, they'll run and they inevitably run to somebody else's property, almost always, uh, in order to keep from trespassing on those properties. Uh, particularly if people aren't home when we try to call them or come to the door to ask permission to come and, and deal with the deer, um, then uh, we're stuck. We're legally not, not allowed to go get the deer. So we ask for permission in advance of hunting uh, that if we can't contact you, uh, that uh, you are giving us advanced permission to track and retrieve. That's what that's about. Um, some people, you know, run the run trail cameras for us. They observe, they, they give us some, usually when, when I go interview a, a homeowner about um, uh, their deer, or they want, to, want us to hunt, uh, they tell us where they see the deer. That's, that's information, that's intelligence that you can gather uh, to help us uh, uh, be more efficient. Um, Check for what the deer are doing. What's most people, you know, come to us with a pretty well uh, informed uh, description of what the deer are doing to their vegetation, and how they bother them, how many accidents their family have had with deer, uh, how many cases of Lyme disease they know about, etc. So, uh, you know, that's that's intelligence that that uh, that our archers and, and I uh, want to hear. Uh, spread the word. Learn about deer management and inform others. Neighborhoods need to be hunted. Individual properties we can hunt, but it's much more efficient and effective in the long term uh, if I have a number of properties in a neighborhood where we can move around. When the deer get tired of us one place or they get scared of us one place, we can move to someplace else in the neighborhood where they've gone to. So uh, you, community cooperation is a, is a big, a big uh, support for what we're doing. And of course, you can support Green Fire with time, uh, expertise, and dollars. That doesn't happen much, but so what? Now, one th one, this is one, one natural phenomenon that um, a lot of landowners, uh, particularly people who are new to, new to Great Falls, don't understand, is the deer overpopulation problem has not been with us for long. Uh, this is a, a, up through 2011, is a chart of the deer harvest uh, in all of Fairfax County, uh, since 1955. And you can see there was a little bitty bit around 1960, not many latest. Part of this is there weren't many hunters in Great Fa in Fairfax County. But the reason there weren't many hunters is there, there are almost no deer. It'll take me 10 minutes to explain that, but take my word for it. It wasn't until around 1990 that they really became a, a problem. And even through 2011, the number I'm sure is higher. I just haven't uh, gone to track down the data. Um, it's, it's taken off, uh, uh, not logarithmically, but, but pretty, pretty strongly. Uh, so the number of deer we have now are, are not, they weren't here in 1994 when I moved to Great Falls. When my wife and I saw, saw deer, we moved here, we got all excited and oh good, there's good wildlife here. 
And it wasn't until about 2000 uh, that we were going, oh man, there's too many deer and they're eating all the, uh, the plants in our, the, in our woods. So that's, that's the time frame for this going on. It's current, it's going on now. What, what else besides eating the woods you know, are deer doing? I, I, I review these with, um, with a lot of people to understand that not only is deer population control part of stewardship of the land, but there are other impacts that um, the deer are having. One is public safety having to do with, with vehicle collisions. Um, so many families I talk to, um, it's hard to find families, in fact, that, uh, that lived in Great Falls for, for some time that haven't had some kind of run in, so to speak, uh, with deer. Uh, statewide, thousands of deer uh, collisions happen. Uh, the, uh, and in fact, there have been human injuries and several deaths reported in Fairfax County uh, since 1996 when, when the collision statistics first started being collected. Um, everyone understands about the, the risk of deer, and, and I think most people understand, you know, drive carefully in the fall. This is the middle of the rut right now, although I haven't seen a lot of rut activity. Um, I think that, you know, this is the time when deer, particularly the bucks, get a lot of nuts. They don't, they don't follow their normal, their normal patterns. They're, they're as likely to be in the middle of the road in front of you as they are in the woods. Deer also pro, 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 pose health threats uh, to people and to other deer. Um, deer are the primary food so source for ticks that are vectors for several human diseases. The most frequent one is Lyme disease. So many families I've talked to in, in my area of Great Falls, it, it was over 10% uh, when I did a survey back uh, in the early 2000s. Um, uh, the, uh, I'm going to read you some of the other ones so you, you understand. Let me find the notes. Um, Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever is a different tick, um, ericoliosis and, and babesiosis. I'm not familiar with those, but that's, they, they pass those things on. The deal is that ticks um, go from one stage to the other of their life cycle <clears throat> when they have a blood meal. Early stages of tick growth you know, are going after shrews and voles and chipmunks and, and, and our smaller mammals. Uh, the adult female tick, which needs a blood meal before it can lay eggs, before it can reduce, uh, uh, reproduce, um, usually goes, they're larger animals, dogs, um, and particularly deer. Deer not only provide this primary food source for the deer and therefore support the organization, they also provide a transportation system. So that if you could kill off all the deer, all the, uh, the, the ticks on your property uh, this year, Next year, they're going to be back. Uh, the deer are going to, are going to they transport them. Tickets has its blood meal. It falls off wherever the deer happens to be. Um, disease transmission amongst deer and to domestic animals is more rapid at higher deer density. It's almost a one-to-one -one correlation. You got more deer, you're going to have more, there's more contact and therefore they, they can pass the disease faster. It's kind of like COVID. You know, you get a hundred people in a small room and, and it, the, Transmission is much more likely than if you have two people in the room. Um, the, uh, what, I'm going to show you some, some, some pictures of, of deer diseases that, and, and, and give you some alerts uh, on deer diseases that we need to be concerned about. Um, the economic uh, losses in addition to collisions uh, is, is damage to landscape plants. Um, <clears throat> we've all seen the, the evergreen trees around they form borders around a number of properties where it looks like a lollipop. The, the bottom has all been, been uh, eaten away and you have a tuft at the top. Um, you can't grow uh, a, a vegetable garden in Great Falls um, productively unless you build a fence. And, and, and if, it's a big, if it's a big garden, it needs to be like an eight foot tall fence to, uh, to be able to garden. So as, as a result, we don't see many gardens anymore in Great Falls. Couple of slides to illustrate the points. Uh, this is uh, this hole in the windshield was caused uh, by a deer. There's another shot of this same accident with the deer still hanging out on the on the on the uh, hood of the car. Um, I didn't want to use that one. It's, it's just too gross. Uh, but this this happened in Great Falls. It really got the county deer program going. I think back in 1998 or 99. <clears throat> a lady here. Um, it was in McLean on Old Dominion Road. Um, 
had a deer come through her windshield and, and, it, uh, and it was fatal. Uh, and, and she was well known to county officials and the, the county deer program, in fact, got its start uh, because of that fatal action. This is, I'm, I'm sorry about this slide. I didn't realize it'd be so in your face. Uh, but um, this is a typ really typical bullet rash uh, caused by Lyme disease. Um, only about 80% of the cases uh, have the, the classic bullet rash. Sometimes it's just a reddening. Sometimes there's no, there's no uh, rash at all. So you can't use this as being diagnostic. But uh, if you do see this, you, you need to get to a doctor. The sooner Lyme disease is treated, the more successful the treatment will be. Here's just another example. You see different colors. I mean, the skin is a different color too, but you see the bullet rash around, around the bite. This is a, a map, uh, the most recent uh, map I could find was 2016, a map of the uh, number of Lyme, degree, Lyme disease cases per 100,000 people. Fairfax County has got a moderate level, but it's, it's, it's for real. And um, I ha haven't seen anything recent that shows the distribution of, of Lyme cases around Fairfax. There was an old map, but there's been nothing new. Uh, suffice to say, Great Falls is, is, uh, is, a, is a high frequency area. This is a, the picture of, I'm sorry about the graininess of this one, but uh, this is a picture of what disease deer pass amongst themselves. This is a deer that's dying of chronic wasting disease. Once a deer catches this, it's inevitably fatal. You see how skinny the deer is. He's probably lethargic, they drool. Uh, they're not very attractive deer. Uh, we have chronic wasting disease, CWD, in Virginia. Uh, the original outbreak was in uh, the area west of, of, of um, Winchester, and it has since spread. For several years, the, the uh, CWD was found in deer. The, the Department of Wildlife uh, Resources has got an active program monitoring for CWD. Um, the, the cases were limited to, to Shenandoah Valley in particular around, around the Winchester area. I think it was the year before last, uh, a, a, a positive deer showed up in, in Culpeper County. And since then, there's been another one in, in Fauquier County. Now, if, if this disease could make it from the Shenandoah Valley to the eastern side of the Blue Ridge, uh, a distance that about, is about equal from Winchester to here, uh, it, it can come here. Uh, Loudoun County and Fauquier County are already designated part of chronic wasting disease watch areas where, where hunters are expected to uh, provide samples, of, not for all deer, but for some deer, uh, to monitor the spread of this disease. The sooner we get the deer population down, deer density down, uh, the less likely we are to get this disease here. The, the problem here is that a lot of hunters me, for instance, uh, not going to be hunting deer uh, when you don't particularly want to eat the venison. Um, and so if it gets here, it may well, uh, it's going to change the game for us. And I hate to see that happen. Uh, here's an example of, of a landscaping plant about to be eaten by this, uh, by this young buck. <laughs> Sometime in the summer, you can tell by his the vel velvet on his antlers. Uh, that's okay. They're hungry uh, all year long, <clears throat> and they will eat whatever landscape plants you make available to them, as many people have learned. <coughs> uh, but the impacts of, that, you know, as, as, a, as an environmental scientist and, and uh, uh, all the other duties I have that focus really on natural resources, it's the ecological damages that, that I, I am most um, uh, interested in. Uh, one is that the uh, forest regeneration in Fairfax County uh, has been almost uh, eliminated. Jim McClone, who's our, our state forester uh, serving Fairfax County, uh, will, tell, will tell you that uh, forest regeneration occurs very few places uh, in Fairfax County uh, because of deer, too many deer. Um, the forest structure, what, what is the healthy forest it depends upon the structure, particularly the, the vertical structure, the, the understory, uh, you know, the soil, the herbs, the uh, uh, shrubs, the understory player, uh, layers, and the, um, and the canopy trees. 
that understory uh, is vegetation is often removed. I've got places where I hunt where the only thing growing in the woods is still grass. Um, it's because the deer come through so frequently, they're eating all the, the native plants. Um, the forest composition, the, the native species and the mix of plants and whatnot, uh, isn't just change for this year. Once it has changed as drastically as it has, uh, though the composition of the forest is changed for decades, possibly even centuries. Uh, we kind of passed that, we've already done it, uh, but it won't start to recover until we get the deer, deer density down. And with the change in the forest, you have uh, uh, your, the runoff uh, in, from, from forest is so much cleaner than runoff from a lawn or, or forest which has been denuded of understory. Um, uh, that, that one of the reasons is, is to, um, uh, that I want to restore forest is, is the ecosystem services. Not only uh, cleaning up the air, cleaning up the surface water runoff, um, and, and sequestering carbon. And something that many people are talking about wildlife, uh, the, the biodiversity of our landscape is, is changed. When we lose uh, many, many of the plants that deer really like are gone. And that, that reduces the number of insects and, and other, other uh, uh, parts of the biota that depend upon those plants. Um, Overbrowsing, I mentioned this before, overbrowsing um, uh, actually accelerates the invasiveness of plants that deer don't like. Uh, when, when the deer are eating the native plants, um, they're clearing the stage for the invasive plants uh, to take over, as they have done and will continue to do. <clears throat> to illustrate the uh, impacts of deer browse, we've got two, two settings, one in Mount Vernon District Park on the left, uh, which has got very few deer. The, the very most urban parts of, of, of Northern Virginia don't have many deer. They, they're getting more and more, but, but this is a healthy and diverse understory for, for a park that, that has almost entirely, they're all hardwood uh, uh, trees. By contrast, uh, Groveton Heights Park uh, is heavily browsed. Uh, most of the green you see back here uh, is still grass. Uh, you can see some, some invasive vines hanging over, over uh, these probably dying young trees here. This is unhealthy. It's not, it's not diverse. Um, the, the runoff is not going to be the same quality as, as the Mount Vernon District Park. Uh, so it, it is a real consequence. It's not just, oh, it doesn't look pretty. Uh, the, there are other real environmental consequences too. Too many deer. So our goals are to recover forest ecosystems. In, in, I should say goals in, in managing deer populations to recover the forest ecosystems, not only the vegetation, but also the, the animal uh, populations. And from a human perspective, improve safety, uh, our economic uh, losses, and in fact, to protect our, our health. Uh, I like to tell people the slogan, another slogan is manage the damages. Uh, do what you need to do to reduce the damages. And, and clearly one of those things to Major damage is to reduce deer populations as humanely as possible. Switch gears here a minute, green fire. Uh, everything we do is documented. This is the landowner agreement that uh, uh, I want when people contact me uh, and say, you know, come talking about uh, hunting my property. Uh, I, we have an interview that lasts anywhere from half an hour to 45 minutes. And we go through this form giving them the option to, at the top, uh, give us access for hunting and tracking retrieval, or if there's reasons why the land shouldn't be hunted, uh, and sometimes it's, others want us to hunt, but there's reasons why we don't want to hunt it, uh, then at least get uh, access for tracking and retrieval. I would note the misconception about many people in terms of the, the, uh, the suitability of a piece of property to be hunted, is it has nothing to do with the size of the property. Well, kind of, and, you know, quarter acre or lot is going to be hard, hard to hunt unless you've got 20 quarter acre lots together. Okay, so, but uh, there's nothing in, in Virginia codes or, or, or county um, codes that, that uh, specify a lot size uh, for where you can hunt. Uh, the other, the rest of the information at the top is just uh, contact information. We use this, I put this into a, a, a program that uh, my archers can access from their phones. So if they're sitting in a tree and the deer they shoot 
goes to the neighboring property, they can call up on their on their cell phone uh, and and drill down and find the phone number for those people. He can call them even before he leaves his tree. Say, hey, I had shot a deer. He came on your property. Is it okay if I I come track? Uh, and and he goes and, and does it. But um, we do that. We're respectful of the law. Uh, and, and one of those laws is, is we don't trespass. Uh, where, where we are allowed to um, uh, give them permission to hunt, uh, we use people's property the way they want us to. Um, the property owners are in control. I go through a whole list of questions. There's more questions that are actually on here where I enter the answers under other conditions. Uh, to specify, you know, what the what the landowner wants, and we tell them if what they want is unrealistic, that's that makes the property you know unhuntable. But uh, we we go through that and, and write this down so everyone understands what the drill the drill is. Uh, we've also documented our standards and guidelines. It's about eight pages. It's more. It's I haven't read it in a year or so, but it's kind of de it's very detailed. Uh, we, we lay out the uh, participation guidelines in terms of uh, what landowners, landowners do and don't want. Uh, also, the um, uh, whether their private their private property qualifies. Should we be hunting there? Is it a good place to hunt? Um, the our archer standards are are not guidelines or standards. They they either do these things or they get. We've had to lose a couple of people because they wouldn't follow the standards. Uh, key word for the archers is respect. We respect the landowners, we respect the law, we respect the landowner's neighbors, and we respect the deer. We respect, respect the deer by only taking, only first of all, being, being decent hunters and, and target, target uh, uh, shooters, um, but also uh, we, we respect the law. Uh, there are also standards that apply to green fire. The, the group. So uh, if you want to see these, you can you can email me and I'll send you a copy, a file. Uh, or if you want to look at our, our website, uh, look under the tabs listed here under greenfireweb.com. Um, we make that, those standards available to everyone. We only allow modern archery tools. Uh, some archers like the like the good old days. They want to use a recurve bow, or God forbid, even a straight bow. Uh, we only want to use the most effective and efficient tools. And those are uh, this is a, a, com a compound bow uh, and a crossbow. Um, they're they're so much more effective uh, than than the old the old style wooden bows that is, there's no contest. So we only use modern tools. I want to show you where in Great Falls hunting is occurring. First of all, there's the county program. Some of you may be familiar with the fact that the county um, not only had to have a sharpshooting program, we don't have any of that in Great Falls, um, but they do sharpshoot some places, parks where uh, the other type, types of hunting aren't particularly good or where it's a, a particularly uh, good, look, good park for uh, sharpshooters to practice. They are all members of the SWAT team uh, they, they're amazing shots. I've seen them work. Uh, we don't have that here. Um, <clears throat> what we have here, all of our parks are hunted, are hunted with by archery. And you'll see all along the Potomac River here at the top from Seneca down to River Bend, most of the Potomac River down ab above Great Falls National Park where, where they don't hunt uh, is, is woodlands that are, that are hunted. Have a small park here at Windermere and another one down here at a school board uh, site. Uh, and a little bit down here along a uh, difficult run. <clears throat> so you can see there's a lot of empty space there. Uh, Green Fire tries to fill it up. We want to hunt in between the parks. The, the rest of this territory needs to be managed as well. I wish we had about three or four times this number of clusters. Uh, each star here is a cluster of one or more properties uh, where we have permission to hunt. Uh, including those that, that um, uh, allow us to track and retrieve. So you can see our coverage is pretty good, particularly except here in this corner of Great Falls. Uh, we need more. And, and what, one of the main pitches I want to make tonight is if, if you or friends or acquaintances, you know, have property where they see a lot of deer, have them contract, contact Great Falls for help. Um, we have more qualified archers than we have properties to hunt. So we have some fellows who would spend a lot more time 
taking deer if we could just get them more properties. We all are always recruiting for landowners. How are we doing so far? We've been we've been uh, been hunting as green fire since uh, uh, 2011. That's when uh, we were incorporated and, and we got our 501c3. We currently have 18 clusters. Those are the star you saw. Uh, 109 participating properties. That's that's both track and retrieve and hunt. We have 54 properties where we actually hunt. Uh, some of those we don't hunt so much. A couple of our properties, <coughs> um, they're qualified, but the deer just don't show up enough to, to uh, for our archers to spend the time on. Uh, some of the other properties make up for that and are very productive. Right now we have 17 archers that fluctuates between 15 and 20. And you see the deer harvests, and this is across Great Falls. It's not that big a number of deer. Um, but from, from each year, from September through August, uh, you'll notice that we are, we keep data through August. We get uh, what are called summer kill permits. Uh, between the end of the uh, uh, regular doe season in April and the beginning of the doe season in September, um, for properties that, that can show damages uh, caused by the deer, uh, we can get specific uh, uh, permits to continue to hunt during the summer. So we're 12 months a year operation. I'm getting to the end here. Um, I mentioned earlier about educating people, making them familiar with uh, what's going on. I would, I would invite you to <laughs> look at um, the uh, county, Fairfax County Deer Management Program. I, I, I helped them in the early days of setting up uh, with a variety of things. Uh, they're a bunch of great people and they're doing a good, good job. The county deer program, by the way, is taking uh, on the order of a thousand uh, deer per year uh, through all, all, I think it's 200 and some county parks that are now hunting. Uh, and also go to greenfireweb.com. I have a lot of information there on, on deer damages and, and how the practicalities of dealing with deer. Um, and, and you can entertain yourself for hours uh, pouring through all that stuff uh, <laughs> if you're so inclined. Uh, I'm available to meet with homeowners associations and with civic associations at any time to talk about the ins and outs of hunting uh, in as much detail as you want. Um, it, it can be excruciating. So uh, my contact is email is director at greenfireweb.com. Um, and I took my landline off here because we don't answer it anymore. That's the gap here. Uh, but contact me at 301-512-4762. That is my presentation.